So urea foam formaldehyde is an expanding foam that is made with the combination of formaldehyde and urea. Carbon monoxide, carbon monoxide, a colorless, odorless gas. It is the byproduct of any carbon-based fuel that gets burned. Gas, wood, coal, any of those. The problem with it is this. You literally could be being exposed as we speak and you don't know it because it is colorless and odorless. You have seen or read about many deaths inside of residential houses where the uh, heat exchanger cracked and allowed the gas to escape in the house and literally have killed the people in the house. I personally ha had a friend die that way right after we got out of high school. All right. She was living in a rental and the exchange heat exchanger cracked and Darcy never made it out. All right. So that is a problem. Now, think back to the building code. We talked to the building code the other day and I told you it was a set of standards that explain how buildings have to be made. One of the new standards, and I say new, last eight years, is now any house that is heated with natural gas actually has to have a carbon monoxide detector as part of the system so that if it does leak or crack, the carbon monoxide detector will go off and warn everybody in the house, all right, because of it being colorless and odorless. Polychlorinated biphenyls, uh, what? <laughs> PCBs, PCBs. PCBs is a group of chemicals, it's not just one, and it is most firmly found in nature, but the good thing about PCBs is they are allowed or they tolerate high heat. They can withstand high heat like 2,400 degrees Fahrenheit before they break apart. So because of that, they are used as a great insulation tool or insulating liquid. And if you think about those little gray cylinders that you see at the top of a telephone pole, that is called a step-down transformer. So the high power lines are you know, on the pole but when it comes to your house, in order to get a constant current, there is a step-down transformer that moves the current from a high current down to 220 so that you guys can have it in your house. That's that gray cylinder on top of the telephone pole. Those used to be filled with PCBs because that liquid could withstand that high current and temperature of that power line. It's called a dielectric oil. They also used them in machines, machining when they were as a coolant, so it would, as the drill spinning on metal, they would spray it with this stuff to keep it cool. All right. It has been banned in 1979 those group of chemicals have been controlled since 1979. All right. Can you use that for like generators? Like yes. if you were to take, yeah, you can use it for a generator. Why did they ban it? Because it is a carcinogen. Oh, A1 still too? It's not an A1, it's a possible carcinogen. Oh, okay. They are classified as reasonably carcinogenic. Reasonably. It's reasonable. A1 simply means we have human data proving it. That's all. That is a, a term the scientists use. Carcinogenic is carcinogenic, whether it's reasonable, possible, A1. The only reason we dictate uh, the one as being an A1 is because we actually have human proof that shows radon is a carcinogen.
it also dries out your fat cells in your body. If you've ever seen a person that worked in a machine shop and they use a lot of hand lotion, because what has happened is they probably didn't wear the right PPE gloves and they get machine oil on their hands and they don't really think about it, but after a prolonged exposure, realize that your hand has a lot of fat in it that produces oil so that when you bend your hand, it doesn't crack your skin. Exposure to uh, the PCBs dries out those fat cells which don't release the oil, so people get dry hands. And when you get dry hands in the winter, it's the same concept. The, there's no humidity in the air, so those cells are drying out. And then we put hand lotion on to moisturize our hands. People that work in machine shop for a long number of years get this as a permanent condition because the PCBs have caused that problem. Now, I forgot to tell you guys, I am an environmental engineer. This is what I did in the corporate world. And I usually start this chapter with telling people I can make it long and boring or short and sweet. And everybody goes for short and sweet because nobody wants to hear the long and boring stuff. But I can tell you the physiology and the biology about all of this because this is what I did in the corporate world for a number of years with a company called United Technologies. I was their corporate environmental engineer throughout the eastern half of the United States. I had 14 plants that I was responsible for in nine different states. And this is what I did, a lot of this. Chlorofluorocarbon, CFCs. A CFC is an aerosol, it's a propellant. It used to be in the hairspray. And then we went away from the aerosol into the pump because of the CFC. The problem with chlorofluorocarbons is they've got this organic structure that leaves an oxygen out bonded. And when it breaks off, it forms with oxygen in the air and makes ozone and not the good ozone. It makes the bad ozone. You guys ever heard of those... Uh, they used to run these commercials in the summer about not getting gas before 6 p.m. and not mowing your lawn. That was because of the temperature. They break apart at very low temperatures, like 96 degrees, 94 degrees. So they wanted to make sure if you waited until after 6 p.m., it wouldn't be that warm. So you wouldn't have any issues of creating ozone. Um, they are also a refrigerant. Freon is a CFC. It is a group of chemicals used as a propellant like aerosol and as a refrigerant as in Freon or RF-121 or 112. I can't remember which one those it was. So that is another group of chemicals. All right. Here's the one that you might deal a little with as well. Mold. Mold is it. There is no standard for mold, and there never will be a standard because it is an allergen and works like allergies. You can be susceptible to it, or you can be immune to it. My ex wife was highly allergic to about everything. She literally, when we were doing a lot of investing, she literally could walk to the doorway of a house and stop and go, can you smell that? I'm like, no, I can't. She's like, I can't go in. Because she was allergic to just about everything. So if they had to write a standard for mold to protect my ex-wife, it would be so cost prohibitive that they can't do it. So there is no standards for how much mold you can be exposed to. Now, a lot of banks, when they sell bank owned homes, they have an internal disclosure that they require buyers to sign 
realize it is because of the bank or the seller. It has nothing to do with the real estate world or a federal disclosure or anything like that. A lot of banks will have buyers before they preview the house sign a disclosure saying there could be mold and don't hold us liable if you go in. That's basically what it says. And they're doing that just to cover their ass. There is no mold disclosure in there. Mold is a sy symptomatic issue of what? What is the major problem when you see mold? It is a moisture problem. Means there's a water issue somewhere. Mold requires darkness, food, and water. All right? Now, remember my 72 lawn ornament story? Where the ladies had 72 lawn ornaments and I told you it was my second favorite story? Here's my first favorite story. All right? And we've got the time. Right after I left the corporate world, I got into real estate. My wife at the time, who was the ex-wife, panicked and said, you got to get a job. I want you to have that paycheck on my desk Monday, every Friday, blah, blah, blah. All right. So I went out and I got a job at the American Lead Lab here in Indianapolis, which is an environmental lab. I was the director of the lab. The owner of the lab's name was Michael Sims. If you ever see Michael Sims, he, Southside guy, ask him this story, all right? So remember, this is like 1999, and one of the big issues with mold was indoor air quality. People in the office were breathing mold out of the ducts and getting sick. And Michael was absolutely, bar none, the best salesman in the world I ever knew. He had that personality, he had that likability quality, he had the knowledge, everything. He could sell, the old saying is he could sell, you know, refrigerators to an Eskimo. He was that good. And he came to me one day and he's like, hey man, I can sell this indoor air quality mold uh, sampling if you know how to test for it. Can you set the lab up? I'm like, Micah. I've done this in grad school. We took a whole semester. I know how to sample mold. I know how to set up the equipment. We can do all of that. He's like, okay, great. So we get our first gig in Richmond, Indiana. Now, I got to give you a little education to make this story funny. You guys ever heard of black mold? The deadly poisonous? It's called stachyobitris. I did not ever see any of it. Very rare, very rare, all right? There's that black mold that looks fuzzy, that's not it. Stachyobitris looks like pudding skin. You guys ever made pudding, put it in your refrigerator, and then later you can like write your name in the top of it? That's what stachyobitis, real greasy, oily looking kind of mold. And here's the other thing. Stachyobitris only grows on cellulose, wood, paper, drywall, it doesn't grow on oranges, bread. Those are all different kinds of molds, all right? So when your oranges go bad and they turn that blue purple, that's cladosporium. That is not stachyobitris. It's not the same poison. It's not the same mold. <laughs> you can grow penicillin. Some people eat penicillin, right? That's what penicillin is, comes from a mold. Some people are allergic to it. Kim was allergic to, she couldn't have penicillin if she ever went to the ER. So black mold grows on cellulose. We know this. So we get a call from Richmond and there is a house in Richmond that, and the best way to explain it was like a, uh, I don't even know, I don't wanna say a halfway house, there were four gentlemen that lived in it aged 18 to 22 that had Down syndrome and they were living together and in the basement was the nurse and they rotated shifts to make sure these boys, you know, didn't hurt themselves for emergencies. They were pretty self-sufficient, but she would like help them cook and 
first aid or anything like that. So she calls us and says, look, we've got mold in the basement of this house. We want to get it cleaned out. We said, okay. So we go in to the house. We go down the stairs into the basement through her living quarters into the storage area and the back wall are those gray cement blocks. You guys know what I'm talking about. The foundation blocks. That was what the back wall was made of. In the middle of that wall, there was some mold growing in through the grout of that wall. Now, out of the gate, what do you know from what I've told you? It cannot be stachyobitris. It is not the poison, the deadly one, because it's not growing in the right place. So, Michael Sims is his name. Nurse walks up and goes, there's the mold. What can we do about it? Mike, Mike Sims goes, and licked it off the wall. And that nurse looked like those cartoons where they're waving their arm. Ah! And she starts running circles around us. Oh, my God, he's going to die. What's going on? And I'm like, don't worry. He's okay. He's trained to do this. This is our first one. And Mike goes, that tastes like cladosporium to me. And she's like, how is he going to? Is there I'm like, okay, don't worry. So we take the, I take the sample of the tape. Mike's standing there the whole time like this. She's crying and screaming. I'm talking her down off the cliff. I'm taking the sample. We leave. We get in the car. Mike looks over at me and goes, let's go to a gas station. This tastes like shit. I'm like, well, you dumbass. You did it. You know, he literally licked the mold off the wall to show this nurse that that mold was not dangerous. All right. But, I mean, she's like, what? Starts running circles around us. And it literally came back as cladosporium. Now, it was a lucky guess on his part because he only knew like three names. You know, aspergillus, penicillium, cladosporium. And he just guessed. But the problem was he just literally leaned forward and licked it right off the wall. And she's, wah! And I'm talking her down this whole time. Oh, it's okay. He's trained. He went to school for this. It's our very first one we'd ever done. And he's licking stuff off the wall. So we ended up cleaning that mold off about six times over the course of about 17 months because they never would address the real problem was they had a water leak somewhere. Our guess was that the grade to the house where it met the wall probably was negative and should have been positive and water was running back in and causing that mold to grow. They never wanted to spend the large amount of money to fix the water problem. They just paid us to clean it. And we came back about every six weeks and cleaned the mold off, mold off the walls. Little bleach, little water, dry it off, cool it with the pan, come back, see you in six weeks, all right? So mold's problem is a systemic issue of a water problem. You probably have a water issue somewhere.